Line scalded down the line. This is gone. Another day. Another hit. Another home run. Time France. Two nothing Mariners. Hey, Mariner fans. Welcome back to another episode of Monday Mojo. And as you just heard, Goldie calling Ty France. That's what we got to open today's episode with because, my God, Ty France, uh, the man's on fire. He is – we had a we had a, we saw that list come out, which I retweeted, um, and it was like ranking the league's best first baseman. And Ty France wasn't even on that list, and so I put out the tweet saying that that must have been a hypothetical list where Ty France was never born because – Ty France is the king of the world right now. I mean, he's third in batting average, right, with a 367. Um, in the sweep that we just had, how sweep it is, uh, he batted 500. And leading the league in hits with 21. I mean, his wife, I, I got to hear your thoughts on on the man himself, Viva Ty France. Uh, what a damn performance he's putting on. Yeah, I mean, what more can you say? I mean, 367, third in the in the AL, as you're talking about, but 500 on that sweep. I mean, it seemed like every time he was coming up, he went, what, four for five, or did he have five hits in that 13-7 uh, win? Yeah, he had his first, it was his first game. First career game with five hits, man. Yeah, and then today he opens it up with that two-run bomb in the first. Um, yeah, he's just been – he's been – way more than we thought he was going to be. But I was talking about it with you guys off the air that last year, even though he was probably our best hitter, we always saw more power potential. And you have to wonder now that you're looking at what he's doing now, if that wrist injury that he had early, if it just didn't linger and bother him and make him more contact conscious instead of trying to go up there and be the three hitter, number three hitter in our lineup, um, or number two hitter in our lineup. We saw JP betting three we'll get to that. Um, but I mean, for, for, uh, for what he's doing right now, especially with Hanniger out um, fourth in the AL and on base percentage at 441, second in the AL with 17 RBIs uh, tied for first with five home runs in the AL. Um, he walked into the clubhouse just uh, on Sunday um, and he's talking to Julio and he, he, as Julio's walking by, he goes, here comes the J-Rod show. And Julio is like, actually, it's the Ty France show. And it is. It's This is Ty and JP's team. Um, when Hanniger comes back, they're going to all split that. And Robbie Ray is also a leader, but on the pitching side. But, I mean, Ty France, he's he has everyone asking, uh, where did this – how did we – get this guy on our team for for such a a steal we're going to go back to that Padres trade that looks worse and worse the the more you look at it for the Padres dude it does but it looks better and better the more you look at it for us and that's all we give a damn about I mean it's every night like when he had when Ty France is the first inning today right and I you know I'm not expecting a home run in his first at bat no sir no sir but by god I mean is the, he, he hits a freaking home run, a laser beam. And it's the first inning. It's like he just had a perfect night last night, almost perfect, five for six, whatever. But God damn it, he went off. And the first thing he does today is hit a two-run bomb to take the lead after Robbie Ray gave up a, 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 a run in the first. And, dude, I mean, you just can't say enough about the guy. And um, the league's taking notice. The league is taking notice. They all know. And Jesse Winker in the post-game interview today was asking about uh, – Jen Mueller asked him uh, – uh, asked Jesse Winker about Ty France. And he's like – I mean, I feel like this has been known about Ty France that he can rake. Like the league's already known about him. And so I don't know, people, people love him, but it's why I feel exactly what you're saying. I mean, that wrist injury that he tried to play through last year, um, he still ended the year with a 300 uh, above 300 uh, batting average, but that wrist injury took away, I think some of the power and yeah. this year I, I, he was, wasn't he 291? Was he 291? Yeah, but I mean, he was awesome. It doesn't matter. He was still awesome, yeah. But sure, maybe he was under 300, but close to it. But that wrist injury took away the power that he has, and it's clearly coming to show. But another guy that's bringing power to the show, who, like you just mentioned, Christopher Negron put in in that 13-6 to run victory we had in the first inning, J.P. Crawford batting in the three-hole. When I saw that lineup card and I saw J.P. batting in the three-hole, I was like, huh. You know, I wasn't like, what the hell is he doing? Chris Negron, more like, okay, well, let's see what the hell happens. And J.P. Crawford was asked about that as well. Um, when he saw the lineup card, his wife like told him about it. And he was like, 
no, this has got to be wrong. He's like, I'm not in the three hole. He's like, I guess I batted the three hole and put a good swing on it and belted one to, you know, to the, to, to be a homer. And that was a three run bomb. And then we're, I mean, that was I that game how, in general. I loved how pumped he was after he comes around first base. I mean, he's pounding his fist and like, you know, he, he's definitely not a guy that's going to, you're expecting to get up there and, I mean, for one hit home runs, but even slug, I mean, I'm not expecting, uh, he's kind of more of a walk and a, a uh, singles guy, but I mean, this year he's looking like a little bit of a different animal. It'd be nice if he could figure out a way to steal some bases. Um, he still hasn't figured that out. Um, yeah. yeah. How can you, other than Julio Rodriguez, is there a way for somebody to figure out how to steal bases? Like, like uh, Julio proven that he can increase speed because that's what he's done. Like his speed's gone up from last year, apparently from what the experts are saying. But I feel like, you know, a normal, even a, a non Julio Rodriguez person, how, how do they increase their speed? I don't know if you increase your speed, but you can get better jumps and um, a lot of stealing bait. Well, not a lot of it, but it's another little tool that, that can help you just get, that half second quicker uh, from first to second is picking up on whatever starting pitcher you're going against when, if he has a little tell, like what yeah, he does before he delivers the ball. Um, and, you know, I don't even know how much I want to spend on that because I don't, I don't, I don't know if it, it's really even something that like I need him to do as long as he's doing what he's doing, he's playing great defense um, and, I mean, if he's giving us this bat, I'll, I'll take it all day. Um, as far as our our team, Kelnick can steal bags a little bit, but like you said, it's mostly Julio. I mean, he's Julio for- steal. Is it Julio swiping bag every time he reaches base, man? Every time he yeah. reaches, and he's eight for eight now. Eight for eight, right? Is, is it is eight that, for eight? No, it's six it, for six, right? Six for six. I don't know. I might be yeah. looking at numbers crazy, but yeah. Anyways, he he's got a hundred percent success rate when swiping bags, and so. But back back on JP real quick though, and what helped him be so successful is he leads the American league with 16.7 at bats per strikeout. And so this guy is also, by the way, second in war in the American league. But when JP's in the box and when he's swinging at pitches, he's swinging at pitches that are in the zone and he's making in contact and not only making contact with those pitches, but he's barreling the hell up those pitches you see Adolis Garcia in the game against the Rangers when he hit an absolute screamer to center field and that that photo uh, of, of Adolis Garcia trying to him, him leaping up in the air and him like 30 feet away from the ball like not even close to it he completely misread it because JP Crawford's not known for power but he's been barreling up the ball and hitting 100 plus mile exit velo on these things and that one got down for a triple and so the things that JP Crawford's doing I mean dude uh, we might be looking at the first two guys we've talked about this episode, Ty France and JP Crawford, maybe, maybe early to say this 15 games into the season, whatever. I'm going to say it anyways, uh, starters on the all-star team shortstop JP got snubbed last year and Ty France. He's earning that, earning that first base. I mean, they're, they're the best at what they're doing right now. And and I don't think right now, right now, for sure. Um, I don't know if can I can they go- keep it up. Can they keep it up? If they do. Yeah. I don't know if I can go there yet. I mean, Correa's, I think Correa has put up some uh, some good numbers so far. I was no, looking at he hasn't. well, I was looking at value yeah. average is like under two hundred. Yeah, sorry. I was looking at uh, I was listening to a stat that was talking about hard hit pitches, and Correa is like number one. So I just guessed that he was doing doing really well. But you know who's number six is Julio Rodriguez. Sixty one percent of his uh, con- uh, where he makes contact is a hard hit, which is fourth in the AL. And so, that, I mean, we haven't really talked about him yet, but we talk about how unlucky he's been with getting the the no-look strike. We the, got one, though. We got yeah. one. We got one. Oh, my goodness, man. That pitch below his knees. When Julio Rodriguez, everybody in their grandmama would have been looking back at that umpire, right, wondering, like, we know that was a ball. Are you going to call it a ball? And Julio Rodriguez looks back for clarification. He calls it a ball, and the smile and the electricity coming from, coming from Julio uh, was insane. And after that, actually, he was talking with Divish uh, post game. Maybe it was today. I don't know. But he was asking me, he's like, what, like, what through your mind? And Julio was like, I knew that was a ball. And I know I've been keeping my cool and like a level head throughout these, like, you know, these times of the umpires miss uh, uh, calling the balls and strikes wrong. 
And he was like, if he had called that one a strike, I probably would have had some words to say for the first time. You would have seen me get upset. But with that being said, it got called right. Julio, bases loaded walk with the crowd. He's a 21-year-old rookie. And the crowd is Julio, Julio, 28,000 people strong yelling your name. You're in the bat. Bases loaded. No outs. And you're down a run. Were we up a run? Were we down a run? I don't know. But anyways, he, he, he walks him in. And, I mean, the the composure for, for Julio to have in that at-bat as a 21-year-old with 28,000 people chanting your name, unreal. Unreal. No kidding. I mean, 3-2, no outs. You're looking – you're thinking in the box that I'm going to get my pitch for the first time this year. And so you're already thinking about that. And it's a fastball, so you have not – you don't have much time to react. And it looks pretty good. It's coming in just – above the strike zone and then it, it it obviously sinks a little bit below so to see that the whole time and have enough discipline to know that that pitch is going to end up at the bottom uh or below the strike zone yeah i was really impressed with that and um yeah you see him go wild and you see the uh the dugout even before that i was noticing that they panned over the dugout and it got to three two and jp is like clapping his hand and like almost giddy like a kid like, yeah. oh i can't wait for this like we're finally gonna get to see uh julio you know put a huge swing on a, on a pitch because he knows it's coming and then like you're talking about he lays off of it so that was amazing um, he said julio said uh that was the first time he's got goosebumps on the field in, in a professional baseball game and that was after he took the bases loaded walk hearing the reaction from the crowd the first time really he gets goosebumps yeah man it's just like Oh, um, I live for this shit. I so live the, for this. The first time in the majors? Because I doubt that's in the first time. In a professional game. Yeah, oh, in a professional, in a professional game. game. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a uh, last 10, 10 games, though. Eight and two over the last 10. Are we the hottest team in baseball? Are we the hottest team in baseball? I mean, I think we the hottest team in baseball with that plus 18 run differential, which is leading, leading the American League. That fun differential. I know when we ended the season last year, it was at plus 90. Um, I might throw another 100 on that and say plus 190 at the moment because our fun differential has been uh, the electric factory, to say the least. Well, yeah, eight and two over the last in the, in the homestand, right? But since we last recorded, we're five and one. And the one game we lost, we were up five nothing in the first inning. Um, Marco, he actually had pretty good stuff. That changeup was working. He had six Ks, but uh, the game kind of unravels for him. Some big errors by J.P. Crawford, um, and he he owned up to it. He said that Marco shouldn't be in that position because we would we would have been out of the inning. But he had a a big error, and or was it two errors? Did he have two errors? Um, I know there are two errors on like one play. Him and Eugenio. That was, or was that no that that was no that was yesterday. Or that was Sorry, yesterday. That was Saturday. That was Saturday. Um, he may have had two errors. I don't know, but, but I mean, been, it, defensively, he's been a little uncharacteristic. But I mean, back to my point: if you win that game, you you were six and zero oh since the last time we we took the mic and talked about our Mariners. I mean, we we got the uh, we got the Rays coming in too. Who, you know, I mean, they're a great team, but we seem to have their number. Can I be somebody from Tampa Bay talking to somebody from Seattle real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, Daddy. <laughs> all right, that's it. Is that all you we got? Are, we are, you know, we are their daddies. Six what was our re- what year. was our record? Six and one, six and one against them last year, and they had the best record in the American League. So we took it to them. We had their number. Uh, I'm excited to go back to Tampa Bay, and I, I know that they don't want any anything to do with us because of what happened last year. We're so much better than we were last year. And we've been so successful, meanwhile, without Paul Seawald, without Mitch Hanniger, without Scott Service, and Christopher Negron. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I know it's a very collaborative and team effort, right, um, going into to when a situation like this happens where your coach, your manager is, is out because of COVID. Um you don't really know, like you expect, you don't know what to expect to that's going to happen. Right. And I think Christopher Negron, he's done a great job. Um, and it's the rest of the coaching staff as well. It's a very community, uh, uh, collective effort, whatever the word is collaborative. There we go. But you, you got to imagine how, how kind of difficult would that be for a guy that's not the manager just to get called up and be like, Hey buddy, guess what? You're managing now. Our guy's out I don't know. Uh, I don't, with COVID. I don't want to steal your thunder. I don't think it'd be that difficult at all. 
Yeah. I think I, I think I can do it. I think you could do it because the plan is already laid out in front of you. I mean, he did, he did get a little bit creative with that putting uh, Crawford in the three hole, but I mean, once this game starts to unravel, I mean, he didn't, he didn't switch up too much in the lineup and you kind of know when a guy comes out who, who, how it falls to the bullpen. If it's a low leverage situation, let's say in the sixth inning, you're going to see more, uh, you know, guys like Festa and Ramirez and, you know, uh, Masevich. But when you start to get into those, you know, six or I mean, seventh, eighth, ninth, you're going to, I mean, Seawald was out like you're talking about, but you're going to Castillo. You're going to Steckenrider, Ryder who did not have a good uh, uh, week, by the way, but you're going to those guys. And I don't know. I think it's kind of more of a thing. I'm not trying to steal the thunder away from Negron. And I, I mean, I think he did a fine job. I don't really He's know. He's done a great he, job. Great job. I, I don't, I, I don't, I just don't think you can, it's more about the players. I don't think that you can, you could step in there and completely mess it up unless he was just like a, Hey, uh, I just, I have a totally different idea of what I'm going to do with this team. I'm going to bat, you know, Julio number one, because I like his speed. And then we're going to see, uh, you know, just a complete shakeup. Yeah. I mean, then, then I would be calling him an idiot. I think he pretty much stood in there. He did what he had to do. We were winning under him, so he couldn't have done much better, but um, I don't know. A manager, a manager in baseball is, I don't know how much he matters. I'm so curious. Oh man. What do you mean? What do you mean? A manager matters matters so much. He, they service mattered last year because he, he put the team together and then he had that the way that he was deploying the bullpen. But now that that blueprint's already out there, I I don't even know why we're talking about this because I I'm fine with Negron. I mean, it's just that I don't think that he could have stepped in there and like totally messed it up. It's like, dude, just, just kind of sit in for me, sit in for me, let the guys do what they're doing. And, we and, know, they did. and, and we know how, how much they're probably in conversation together as well. You know, they're talking, yeah. texting. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure service is tech. Is it, would it be legal? He could text them yeah, during the game, right? Like in the dugout or can he FaceTime him? Can he zoom him? Could he be, on I don't zoom? know. I don't know about during the game. I think definitely before the game that he's like, Hey, you know, he might even, you know what MLB, why can't you, the MLB needs to respect the day and age that we're in, in this working environment. They need to allow you to come to work via zoom. If you're not a player, right. Right. <laughs> can, can, can we just, can we just have Scott service on zoom on live zoom during the game? Like, why not? Why can't they do that? Yeah. I mean, uh, hopefully it's his wife. <laughs> I need you to know this answer. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm over the manager thing. It, it's like, yeah, he did a good job, but you know, it's the players that came out and performed. And and we, I think we were, I think we were ready um, to see the Astros. I know that was last episode, but we took it to them. And then we have two teams coming in that are, are kind of weaker teams um, and the Rangers and the Royals. And we just, we went out there and took care of business. I mean, if you want to go over the numbers, Ray took the ball in the first game, six innings pitch, four hits, two earned runs, four Ks, one walk. That was a 6-2 victory. Gilbert, who we need to spend. We could, Logan just, Gilbert. We we could spend the whole episode talking about Logan Gilbert. I mean, we I was I was bullish on him coming into this year, but for him to go out there and he I think he leads the league in ERA right now, 0.56 ERA. Um, but he, he came does, out. He does he does lead the league with the with the lowest ERA. It's pretty nice. But I mean, he came out zero walks. Uh, the strikeouts were, he only got four strikeouts through a uh, 6.2 in each pitch, but I mean, he's out there and he's in command and it looks like, you know, we were talking about it earlier that if you get too lost in the stats, even that 0.56 ERA, I love it, but obviously he's not going to end the year with a 0.56 ERA. And I don't think he's a pitcher that's, you know, 0.56 ERA good, but what he is, is, uh, he's a guy that looks comfortable out there on the mound. He looks like he's he's confident in the fact that i have an overpowering fastball that sets the table for everything and then i throw that wipeout slider he's starting to get a little bit of a feel for the uh what is it change up his change up yeah he's starting to mix in um so he looked great that was the second game four two dub uh then we talked about gonzalez how he came out and i mean his stuff looked good it was just it was kind of a weird performance by him because his stuff looked good but it, it, it was also like he he started hot and then he kind of fell off. I don't know. We blew a five zero lead in the first, but Flex. we didn't blow it. But we didn't blow it. We won. No, we right? did. No, that it's was so, eight. That was the eight six yeah, loss. Yeah, 
yeah, man. I mean, oh, oh, oh. Also, <laughs> I was like, what are you talking? Are you also, listening to the words was, coming out was, of my mouth? Was, are you you listening? To, you hear what's coming out of my mouth? That is that Chris Tucker? Is that Rush Hour? I think so. I think that's I think that's Chris Tucker. I don't know. No, but, we lost uh, that game. We lost. We did that lose. Game. We lost that one. All right. Well, well. Oh, before I forget this nugget, um, Go to ahead. touch on back on Julio Rodriguez, uh, in the game where Ty France hit that single to tie the game that we ended up almost blowing. Then we blew it open in the next inning or whatever, like 13 We're one 13 oh, on Saturday, okay. yeah. not Saturday, but Julio Rodriguez was on second base and Ty France hit a single into right field and anybody else on the Seattle Mariners team standing at second base either doesn't get waved in or if they do, they get hosed out at the plate. But Dylan Moore, Dylan Moore would have made it. Dylan Moore. I don't, I don't think it. so. I don't think Dylan Moore would have made it. I don't because Julio Rodriguez barely beat that throw and he comes sliding in head first, beating that catcher with the tag. And it was, it was just a, such a pretty freaking slide, but I don't it was, think, it was. I don't think anybody else on the team does that. And, and so, I mean, Julio's, I know his bat isn't, Great right now. He's picking it up. He's got hits in the last seven of his nine games. Um, in a few of those, he's got two hits and uh it, per game. And Harold Reynolds, his wife, well, you sent me that video today, and it was talking about how Julio's standing closer in the box. But Harold Reynolds was talking about on MOB network, um, how Julio Rodriguez needs to get sent back down and how he's wasting at bats and how his at bats need to be given given to somebody else. And first of all, who else are we going to be giving him to? Dylan fucking Dylan freaking Moore. I mean, come on, no. But then Julio, this was I think four days ago when he when this video came out. So since then he's kind of had to eat his words because in these last four days, Julio Rodriguez has been going absolutely off. And, and uh, I don't know. But I just completely disagree with what Harold Reynolds was saying. Don't you don't you ever don't you ever tell Julio Rodriguez to go back down? It's just funny because I sent you that video for you to pick up on the first minute. 30 seconds of it where he was talking he made a great point about during spring training when julio was was hitting well and i know it's spring training but he was at least six inches closer to the plate um it looks like he's standing further off of the plate but what you heard was the last five seconds when he he did like the last five minutes it was like everything well, was, was like the, the first minute was the what you wanted me to hear but then i stayed listening to it and it was like I was getting aggravated listening to it. I, I agree with you there. He should not be sent down. And that's a foolish statement by Harold Reynolds. But what he did say made a lot of sense is they're, they're eating him up on the outside corner. And even though a lot of those pitches that he's been uh, rung up on haven't been in the strike zone, that's where they're pitching him. They're either coming uh, inside, which if you were closer to the plate, you wouldn't even be tempted to swing at because you'd be crowding your hands or they're going to that outside corner. They're working the uh, the different sides of the plate against him, and nothing's coming down the middle. And when that ball is on the outside, he's standing so far off the plate that um, he really doesn't even have a chance to hit it. And I'm not saying that, you know, his eye hasn't been pretty good because most of those are balls. His eye's been phenomenal. Just move in a tiny bit. Look at, look at, I mean, we'll go back to Ty France. Also, what about Salvador Perez? They're all over the plate. They force you to throw that ball on the outside corner because they're they're all over it. Ty France gets hit a ton. So I, I don't know if you want uh Julio getting we, beamed like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Ty France crowds heavy and he gets he gets hit. But what I like what you, you just brought up, Salvador Perez, because that guy is like one of the most comfortable people in the box, like ever. But when he was going against Matt Brash. Um, there was, it was deep into the count and it was a battle between Brash and Salvador. And there was a heater that Brash threw. It was like 95 down the pipe, down Broadway. And Salvador just fouls it off and wasted the pitch because he was crowding and waiting for that breaking ball, that slider. And you do not see that often with Salvador Perez, just trying to get something on, on the ball, some piece of the bat on the ball to foul it off and get another pitch on a fastball. Yeah down Broadway. And that just goes to show the stuff that Matt Brash has. I mean, that guy in his third start in the MLB was making the veteran, the veteran batters in the league, very uncomfortable in the box. And he ended up getting them out. So uh, that was good to see. I just wanted to put point that out. Well, yeah, I, th I thought you were actually going to bring up like a pitch or two before that, when he throws a slider, nasty slider on the inside corner that catches the zone and you see Salvador kind of look down and smile, and then he looks back to Murphy, and he's, like, laughing. Obviously, you don't know what he said, but Goldie uh, saw it, too, and, and Goldsmith was like, 
you have to think that he's saying to Tom Murphy right now, what in the world was that? Like, yeah, that was a nasty pitch. But to your point, he was trying to sit on that slider because you have to sit on it. You have to be thinking slider to hit that pitch where usually you're sitting fastball, especially if a guy has a 96 mile an hour fastball, you have to be, you can't be late on the fastball, but he was sitting slider. And then when that fastball does come, like you're talking about, he just put a little weak uh, swing on it to spoil it. Um, Matt Brash has been filthy, but he is Matt Brash is like, effectively wild still no he's effectively wild, but he's also like a different pitcher than we have like our our organizational philosophy is also or is obviously to control the zone limit walks um we don't have a ton of strikeout guys obviously ray is and um i guess gilbert gilbert's creepy yeah logan is but i mean flex is brash is the guy that i'm talking about that doesn't fit the mold we use we've usually you know been we pitch to contact and clean it up with our good infield defense. But Brash is, you know, he does walk some guys. He had four walks in this last one. He only made it 4.1 innings, um, three earned runs. Actually, only had two Ks. But he had that long first inning. I think he started the game off against Nicky Lopez. Nicky Lopez took him like nine pitches and then walked. And it was a 30-pitch inning. But then he started to settle down. I don't know. Back to my point. I just think that Brash is a little bit, he, he's, he's effectively wild. Like we're talking about, he's just a little bit different than what we're used to seeing. Um, I mean, Robbie Ray. Yeah. He's a strikeout guy, but he, he fits our organizational uh, philosophy. He pounds the zone. He'll get first pitch strikes all day long. I guess Brash did too, but Brash is Brash walks a lot of guys. He does. And I, we want him to fit our organizational strategy. We're still like trying to get him to control the zone. I think we prefer that. Right. But at the same time, as you're saying, I mean, he, he said in the interview, he was on pitching ninja. And when Matt Brash is lining up to throw a pitch, he's basically aiming center center of the plate. When it's a a breaking ball, knuckle curve or the slider, he's aiming center of the plate and just throwing it as hard as he can and letting the ball do the rest. And so, yeah, no, you're, you ain't wrong with, he doesn't fit that organizational mold as much as the others. But you need a little bit of a, a hiccup in that in that rotation, a little bit of a, a bump, a, a mix, you know, yeah. spice it up, get it nice. But uh, but yeah, but back to speaking of bad takes, I know Harold Reynolds is what we were talking about earlier. Mike Salk, uh, he had a hot take, a hot take this last week, uh, more so just a quote, um, which was, I hope Kyle Seeger burns. I want him to burn is what the quote was. Um, and so I know you wanted, I know you wanted to bring this up on the show today, but, uh, I mean, how can I I can get people don't like Kyle Seeger, but like Mike Salk, like straight up hates the guy. And I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on this, on this wife? On his hate for Seeger. It's, it's like when people are looking at the, they try to match up the contract with the production and it's almost like the Robinson Cano situation it's like if you look at what robinson cano did for the mariners he was a great he was a really good player for us he if you look at his war if you look at his average if you look at his slugging percentage we batted him you know three for us for all those years and we we had some years where we were you know make we had a year where i think 2017 where we came up one game short of the playoffs or two games short 18 but people 18 people uh-huh. people remember robinson cano like he sucked or something and they have this like oh like you have a cano jersey i have a cano jersey and people have come up to me and been like oh <laughs> evan, like, evan has a cano jersey too i think yeah it's like i don't want to be like you guys know that he was good for us and yeah we got out at the perfect time back to kyle seager people are just upset with him because in 2018 the last year we had him in his contract he yes. was suspended for like the entire year and sure. that was that was the year where we were so close to the playoffs and so you know it's but, not about how you hold on it's not about how you start right it's about how you finish and how you finish is what's going to leave people is, is what's going to be your memory right? That's going to be your legacy within an organization. And so that's why there's the bad taste in his mouth because he got got caught cheating in one of the most important seasons up till 2018, you know? Sure. But I mean, this is what people, so this is what Salk is thinking about uh, Kyle Seeger is that he was set to make $20 million um, this year if we would have picked up his option. Okay. We didn't. And yes, it would have been a, a big time overpay, but guess what? 
but when the time or for the amount of time that he was with us, I think his war was over 30. He was a, a phenomenal uh, third baseman defensively. He hit 35 home runs for us last year or whatever it was. He was a big part of what we did last year. I have no idea where this is coming from. I think he's just stoked that Gino Suarez has come in, has looked comfortable over there defensively, which we were all worried about. And then now is just like a, a slugging, you know, machine. Every every hit it seems like is going into the gap. Or uh, I think he has two home runs, but it seems what he has like five doubles or something. Three homers. Three homers. Three homers. Yeah. yeah. He's a slugging machine. And so Salk is all about the. It does seem personal, like you're talking about. He has something against Cal Seeger. Dude, I think he's got something against Julius Seeger, honestly. Because he was talking about like when he's like. Like, no, now I won't have to see E. Eugenio's wife, like, posting, like, updates on Twitter every every now and then, like Julie Seeger was. I don't know. It just seemed like misplaced. First of all, I mean, it just came out of left field. I think that's what caught everybody off surprise. Like, you can, you can feel how you want about somebody, but he just, like, out of nowhere brings up, like, I want Kyle Seeger to burn. And it's yeah, like, dude, wild. like, that's, that's a stretch. Like, you don't have to like a guy. But when you're saying, like, I want somebody to burn out of, like, thin air, out of nowhere, like, sure, just be excited about E. Eugenio Suarez being an absolute boss and an absolute savage. Um, but you don't have to fuck, you don't have to take it that far, which he did. So uh, he got backlash. J.P. Crawford tweeted at him. Mitch Haniger tweeted at him. John Boy Media tweeted about it. Uh, so, you know, Mike Salk just creating uh, havoc where havoc doesn't need to be. Yeah, He's shooting he- himself in the foot. All he had to say was, I'm happy that we didn't pick up Cal Seeger's option, and I'm happy we pivoted and picked up Suarez, who looks like right now is an upgrade at third base. It doesn't mean I hate Cal Seeger. I can still appreciate what he did for the organization, and you should. If, you, if you're if you not, it's kind of weird. And, and then to take it to the, I hope Cal Seeger burns and what, I mean, I don't even, that's just such weird energy. Yeah. Um, he, and then, and then, but, but Mike I, ends it. He, he ends it with like, and I love e, 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 Eugenio because he's all about positive vibes only. And it's like, all right, positive vibes only. If you love him for that reason, then how about you practice positive vibes only and don't tell somebody to burn? That's not positive vibes. That's very odd energy, as you just said. I almost wonder. Yeah, you brought up his wife. I w- almost wonder if Salk and uh, Seeger had some sort of, like, you know, he. He didn't want to come on a show because I don't ever remember him being on. on I don't a show think any or, dude. I don't think anybody for the Mariners is going to go, or at least the players, at least not not uh, now, dude. No, 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 they're not going to go on a show at all. So, like, that's where I'm saying he's just like there was no need for him to create or bring that up or say it in the way that he did. But you know, shooting yourself in the foot, Mike Salk, sucks to suck. I guess I think it's a good segue to talk about Gino Suarez though, because yes, we were worried about his defense, or at least I was. We did preference it by saying, you know, the Reds tried to play him at shortstop last year, which doesn't even make sense if you look at his body, his range. He has a good throwing arm, but like that's the only uh tool that would even profile at shortstop. But over there at third, I, I haven't seen him make one. Oh, well, he actually today was the first time he made that throwing error. Before that, though, he, he has a strong throwing arm and he, his defense doesn't need to be his best tool. He's going to get up there and slug, which we've seen that we've seen him walk. And then if he can just be league average at third base defensively, I mean, this was the second part of that Reds trade. We went and we wanted Winker. No. Um, you know, we knew we had a hole at third and we knew that he had to come back as well, but the Reds didn't want to pay that contract. We're paying him what? 13 million a year, which that isn't crazy, but I, I don't think, I think it's probably a little bit more than we're comfortable with, but not if he hits like this, not if he yeah, if he's hitting like this, I'm comfortable as hell with it. Right. So, I mean, he's just been, he's just been a, a, a bright spot for me. Um, especially with, with Hanniger out where he's moved into that four spot for us and he's had some big hits. Uh, I think he's, he's carried the lineup at times when, when um, Winker's had the, some games where he struggled, France has been killing it. So has JP, but after that, you know, it's been spotty with Julio Toro Kelnick. It looks, you know, like he's starting to figure it out, but 
Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. He I was, he has some I, weird games. Kelnick has some weird games. It's like I was thinking about this dude with, with Kelnick. Like, sorry to interrupt you there, but um, no, no, no. Yeah, you're good. With, with, with the crowd was chanting Julio's name, and beforehand they were chanting JP's name. You know, JP, JP, the Julio, who you know everybody's chanting twenty eight thousand strong, and you know Jared like deep down like. Yeah. As he wants to be a superstar. He wants to, you know, he loves the city. He wants the city to love him back. I love him back. Don't, don't, don't worry. You got my love, bud. But um, for nobody was chanting anything for him, right? And you wonder, does that mess with you? Does like, it? Does. I don't know, right? So like, I don't of course, know. because he knows, he knows that Julio. He know he knows he didn't get that in his rookie season. He didn't have anyone chanting his name in his rookie season. And then he's up after Julio, and and it goes. It was kind of quiet. Yeah, yeah, it goes silent. So, um, well, what's his? Would we? Because it's got to be catchy. It's e- it's easy with Julio. It's easy with JP. Do you Kel- do the Kel- Nick. Or, or or do you? Yeah, it's like kind of the Edgar vibe. Like you know, Edgar, Jared. I don't know. Yeah, that but, could work. Yeah, it, it, you, we got to get something catchy. But I don't know. Well, I just I thought about that when I when I saw him up to bat next and it was silent. I was like, huh, something's. It, it, he's got to be thinking about it. Yeah, I, I thought about that as well. And I think that Jared, to me, we've talked about it before. I think I was more patient than most people. Everyone's noticed it, the, the frustration. I'm starting to get frustrated with his frustration. It's like, dude, he didn't even have that bad of a week. I mean, I think he 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 started to mix in some hits. He had that huge triple after after, uh, Julio. yeah. after Julio's double. That was and sexy. It, it, you would think that some of these big hits would allow and the, the team's winning right you would think yeah. some of these big hits would allow him to exhale and release that tension in his shoulders and then you see him it's like the next day he comes up and he he grounds out which is a part of baseball and after he gets past the first base bag and is thrown out he slams his helmet down i'm like dude come on man it's like you're you being that hard on yourself isn't going to isn't going to make this any easier. Like you need to, I don't know, just take a deep breath. So much easier said than done, said than done. Like even for me, dude, like in beer league softball, where it's not the MLB. Um, if I mess up, you will hear me yelling F bombs. You are here. I, I'll be, I'll, I'll get mad, man. I'll get upset. It's just, it's something that some people have. You just can't help it, but I get it. You know, we don't, we want him to mature. We want him to not be upset, you know, at bat, take every app out one at a time. Don't think about the last time, you know, it's a lot easier said than done. I get it, but let's at least give Jared credit where credit's due with potentially helping save the game today because he had an absolute rocket 92.2 miles per hour. Thank you. Stack ass on that throw from right field gunning down Andrew Benatendi. You dummy for round and second base. When Jared's picking up the ball, you're round and second base. And Jared's getting the ball and he hoses you out on a, absolute piss missile to Abraham Toro and Abraham Toro had a phenomenal play at third base as well today, uh, a diving stop, which is awesome to see, but that seed that Jared drew, uh, I, I think that that potentially helps help that uh, obviously 110% helped win the game today. So there's some credit where credit's due. That defense is still good. I was he looks so comfortable. He looks so <laughs> comfortable in right field. He looks so comfortable in right field. I have to say I was golfing when that happened. So I was following the game from this must have been after the sixth inning uh, because I left in the sixth inning. I went golfing, um, but I was following on my phone and I forgot about the extra innings rule. So the top of the 10th comes and uh, I was following on my phone at bottom of the ninth is over and it like my phone is loading. And as I re as it loads, all of a sudden there's a guy on second for the Royals. I was like, what the heck? How, how do they have a guy? Like they already got a double, like what the heck? And then uh, I, it did click on at what happened. So Kelnick, when was this uh, throw that you're talking about? Um, it was later, later in the game. I forget exactly what inning it was. Um, yeah. I heard I, Cal yeah. Raleigh had a huge strikeout with a, a chance to. I yeah. Know. Julio swiped the bag on that. Julio stole the base. Um, but Cal Raleigh struck out Cal Raleigh. But what a big win, right? I terrible. mean, to get the sweep against Kansas city, I got a bug. Yes. Hey, how sweep it is the first house sweep. It is of the year. I love it. 
I love it. It's what we needed. It honestly, it could have been two sweeps in a row, which would have been super double sweep. Sweep squared was what it would have been. But, you know, it is what it is. But, uh, yeah, I mean, hell of a series, man. Hell of a series. Hell of a homestand. Seven and two. Seven and two on the first homestand of the year. Um, folks, it doesn't get much better than that. It sure as shit doesn't. And now, I mean, as we touched on earlier, but coming up next, we get to take on our children, our sons, our daughters, Tampa Bay, uh, you know, six to one against them last year. If we can mimic that, get it. Yeah. I mean, you know, we got, we started with, with Logie, with Logan Gilbert, the best ERA in the league right now. And all of baseball, not American league, all of baseball, that's national and American combined for those of you uh, who don't know, but uh, it's, it's going to be exciting. Then we got, who's, who's after him? We got Brash after, no, no, Marco. Yeah, Mar- Marco, Marco, then Flexen. Then Flexen and Flexen. Hold on. Let's, uh, let's take a step back and talk right. about Chris. He Flexen. was so good. He was oh my so good. goodness. It, just like, kind of like last year, right? It's always when it came to Flexen, I was like, hmm, you know, we hopefully we can still win today. I'm not going to, you know, expect too much out of him, but it seemed like every time I'd say that he'd go and perform like a dominant ACE. And that's what he did. He went seven innings, seven innings, dude. Like if you're having <laughs> your four guy, your five guy, I know Matt Brash is checking our five, but you know, whatever, we'll call him our four guy. You're having him go seven deep, dude. I mean, how could the other, it's just, it's unfair. It's unfair. I mean, between, so between Ray Gilbert, Gonzalez and Flexen for the first four games of this uh, uh, first four games of since the last episode, they had a combined two walks and Flexen, like you're talking about, had zero walks. He went seven complete innings and I had my first, uh, I snapped at someone online for the first time this year. Uh Oh, what happened? <laughs> Yay. I love this. Cause it was right after. So it was right after Gilbert had a, uh, did his thing and the 6.2 that he pitched and he just has been doing his thing all year. And so these rave, this guy's raving about Gilbert and like, man, Gilbert's great. Ray's great. He didn't mention Gonzalez. If he would have bitched about Gonzalez, I might've been a little bit more on board with him, but he goes only weak leak, only weak, weak link in our uh, <laughs> rotation so far as flexing and how it just hit him back with, I mean, I brought the earth down on him. It was bad. Did he then, did he respond? How did, how did, what was the outcome? No, I got a bunch of likes though on it. Ooh. Okay. That's good. I, I was just like, I hit him with the S T F U. Uh Oh, yeah. S T F U. S T F U. And then I just, I don't really want to talk about it. You can find it I, on Mariners. I, just, just shout out to everybody on like Mariners Twitter. I, it's my favorite place in the world. Not Manners Facebook. No, 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 not Manners Facebook. But Manners Twitter is my absolute face pro- favorite place in the world. It's during the games, after the games. I mean, every time we win, too, every single day we win, I am up. I don't get to bed for another two hours, you know, after the game. I'm up watching the highlights. I'm reading the articles. I'm re-watching the highlights. I'm re-reading the articles. I mean, today, today, for example, I got up this morning, beautiful Sunday morning in Seattle, Washington. It was absolutely gorgeous. And what did I want to do? I wanted to walk to Safeway where I could go to Starbucks and I could get my vanilla latte and I could get the copy of the Sunday Seattle Times. And I could read everything about what's been going on the last, you know, yesterday, but also the last week, every article that was in there is all touching on Mariners baseball but just continuing to reread everything after a win it's just like i can't get enough of it and then you go i'll go back to the point of this the mariners twitter like during the games after the games everything i was saying it's just the best place because everybody like on on mariners twitter specifically it's a very positive place for the most part and uh you just get to chime in and have fun conversations with everybody and uh i love it i really do mariners facebook though different story i don't like that one as much God, I, yeah, I don't know. I hate Mariners Facebook. Where was where was this STFU comment? Was that on Facebook? It was on Mar- Mariners Facebook. Yeah, yeah I, I just some of the stuff on there. It's just like it's it's a ton of that overreacting, even even in a good way. Like if you know if something good happens, like Gilbert, it's like oh my God, is he a Cy Young candidate? Which maybe he is, but uh, <laughs> right now know, he's looking like one. They they overreact on everything good or bad. And it's like, dude, have you guys never watched a baseball season before? Like I, and I get if people are excited and they want, but like on the reverse of that, when someone strikes out three times in a game, which is going to happen, if the Mariners lose a series or if they get swept, which is going to happen, all these things are going to happen. No one likes to see it, but like to get on there and start typing, like you're a, 
I don't know. You, you have some big thought on, on who these players are like Flexen's our weak link. It's like, yeah, dude, like he had a if flex is our weak link though. I'll take it. All what, day. His last out, it's all getting kind of jumbled up, but his last outing before this, right. He took the loss, but it's like, dude, if you watch the game, he didn't look bad. He had, a, he had a long inning and um, he, he lost the game, whatever. But like, I liked the way he looked. This is what we we're talking about. Like, do, does the guy look like you wanted him to look? Flexing, I mean, he's been a great find by Jerry Depoto. It's like you're talking about. If he's your weak link, um, which I don't think he is. I think Brash is, and I like Brash, but I think... Well, is, that, it, is calling them the weak link, is that even the right terminology? And he didn't. He he was, he was, it was worse than that. That, that was me. You know, and this but isn't, even, even, this so isn't even verbatim of what point, they said. Beside the point of what that dude said, beside the point of what he said, I'm just saying in general, is it accurate to even say that there's like a weak link or more so just they're not the best in our lineup, you know, in right. our rotation, excuse me. Like, like, I wouldn't even call them a weak link. We're that dominant right now with our pitching. We're dominant with it. You, We don't yeah. have a weak link. What? We just have somebody who's not as good as our number one or our number two. But they all fit. They all fit their number. They all fit if they're, you know, Robbie Ray fits the ace. Logan Gilbert fits the two spot wonderfully. Mm. Marco Gonzalez fits the three spot wonderfully. Flexen fits the four spot wonderfully. And Matt Brash, to round it out, fits the five spot wonderfully. And when you have Matt Brash ending your rotation and Robbie Ray starting it, dude. I would say I would say Flexen is actually our third best starting pitcher, but just because how it falls, you want a lefty with Ray, then you go to a righty with Gilbert, and then you go back to a lefty with Gonzalez, and you go back to a righty with Flexen. So Flexen pitches in our four spot. I think Flexen right now for me, I could eat my words later. You know, Gonzalez is coming off a loss, uh, and Flexen's coming off a win, so and a great win. Um, I might be a little bit, you know, just thinking about how it just went down. But I do think, I think Flexen is our third best pitcher. Marco is probably our fourth best pitcher, but if you were to slot him that way, I think Flexen profiles as a three. Is he a little bit of a weaker three? Maybe. I mean, he's not going to be a big strikeout guy, but I mean, every time he takes the ball, including, I mean, last year, it seemed like every time he took the ball, he gave his chance, a team a chance to the, to win the game. And, and he's going to do that again this year. Marco, I don't have the same feeling for, for that. I, I think that he can, really he can turn it on and he can be really good or he can have his games where it's like he is not dotting his his cutter or his his change up or his fastball and when he's not hitting the edges and the corners and he has to come more over the plate his velocity is just not yeah he's gonna get rocked so you know i'm still fine with him like we were talking about if he profiles as a four for you yeah sure that's fine but back to your point about weakest link yeah, I don't know if that is the right terminology because we even have a question from the dugout. Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get to that question for the dugout. But just to, to, to round this out here, in terms of the entire starting pitching, we have the most innings pitched. Every starting pitcher combined for every team, the Mariners starters have the most innings pitched in baseball. And to complement that, as you would guess, our relieve, relievers, they have the least inning pitches pitched at least innings pitched in all of baseball. And so if we can carry that throughout the season, right. And have our starters go deep into these innings, which Robbie Ray, he's actually the only starter in all of baseball to go six plus innings in each of his four starts. So, you know, you, good job, former Cy Young, uh, keep doing your thing. But when the season it's a marathon, right. And if we can continue having our starting pitching go deep and then our bullpen to be healthy and to be, you know, full of energy and not be worn down towards the last couple months of the season, that's going to be a scary sight for other batting for other, other people batting, you know, other lineups, it's, it's going to be tough for them to deal with late in games. Oh yeah. The formula for winning for us right now is, is get your starter starting pitcher to go, you know, at least, and I, I stress that at least five, if they go at least five, you got four innings left to close that game out. When you have a healthy Seawald, you could go in any order. Seawald, Steckenrider, Munoz, Giles is going to be coming in, Castillo. Those guys, they could all pitch one inning and close a game out if you go five. And in a lot of games, like we were talking about, where Ray goes six innings pitch or Flexen, like he just did, goes seven innings pitch. You have two innings left and you can turn to 
any one of those five guys who look like they're they're going to be what we saw last year. I'm excited to see Giles. What we've seen out of Munoz has been amazing. Um, Castillo, like we talked about last episode, has been uh, it's been a little bit less of a roller coaster ride. It feels like uh, we'll get Seawald back. Second Rider had a bad uh, bad week, but he's always been the guy. Like as far as the consistency goes, I don't think he has. Uh, the swing and miss stuff that Seawald does, or um, I don't know, even the stuff that Castillo does. But Steckenrider just comes in and he just throws strikes, and he's got he's got some pretty good velocity on the fastball, and I just like his his approach out there. But the bullpen's going to be great. That's that's our formula for winning is we have great pitching. Yeah, and we got a we just got a good we just got a good formula right now, man. And we have the pieces that are fitting in that formula. But uh, it's it's good to see. But as you were just touching on, uh, we're bringing it back. We have a, a couple questions from the dugout, and uh, excited for these. Few uh, we had a number of them, but we picked three. First one, I think, is from from Evans' boy, uh, Sean McCabe. Probably saying that last name wrong. Um, but he's just curious about how we handle our outfield situation, who gets left out. And I'm assuming that this is when he means it's a full, a healthy lineup because obviously right now it's not, but he's asking about Hanniger, Kellnick, Winker, Rodriguez, Lewis. How do we handle all of them right now? I mean, to answer that, the depth that we have is depth that we've never seen before. And having the depth that we have is a very good problem to have because in situations like right now where Kyle Lewis isn't healthy, where Mitch Hanna goes, goes on COVID next man step up. And that's where, you know, we got Kelnick Winker and, and Julio right now as our starters. In all honesty, if that, if those two were our starters for the entire season, or excuse me, those three um, don't know how I would feel about that. Not, not, not great. I wouldn't feel great about that at all. But uh, Hanniger, I, I don't know. It's tough because I Kelnick, like I was saying it, uh, earlier, dude looks real nice in right field. He looks comfortable. It looks more natural for him. So I don't know what that happens when, when Hanniger comes back. But handling that situation, you just uh, you you got to play Julio. Julio doesn't get left out. I think when Hanniger's healthy, you play him and, and Kelnick. You use that DH spot to get Winker in there. I mean, it's it's all about utilizing the DH spot, I think, at, at the end of the game and getting all of the bats in the lineup. But Winker's defense, I'm not high on. So I'd rather see, you know, one of the other guys in there, um, but still want Winker's bat in the lineup. I know his bat has been terrible uh numbers wise if you were just looking at a sheet of paper they've been terrible as we mariner fans who've been watching we know that his bat is gonna come alive when it does i don't think it'll stop like when he figures it out i think he's gonna go on an absolute tear it was great 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 to see that walk off he had today and i think he said actually he probably broke a bat in every single at bat today uh on sunday and so he wasn't hitting it hard but he got the sacrifice fly and then he got the walk off single. And so uh, he's doing his thing And he like back to like him being like, I know I'm going off track here, but with him also showing some emotion, um, I, I, I know the reasoning behind his emotion, because as he said at the end of today, and as I, we've heard him say before, when he first got interviewed by Cincinnati's media, when the trade first happened, he was talking about, he's so excited to come to a team that wants to win the, uh, the division that wants to make the playoffs. That's chasing a ring. That's what he's been excited about. And he said, he's never really felt like he's had that true opportunity in his career ever. And so I think where that emotion is coming from is he's seen all these other guys go on tears and he wants to do everything in his power to help this team win. He's not in it for the individual stats he's just like i want to produce because it'll help the team and he's not producing and that's pissing him off because he knows he's not being able to help the team right now but um i don't know i think he's going to figure it out and when he does he's going to go on a tear but in terms of the question sean uh you handle it by utilizing the dh spot and when service gets back i know he's big on you know the the righty lefty matchups going on with who's pitching and who's batting um long-winded answer there i don't even know if i fully answered it but that's what i got zweifel what do you got uh you're gonna see kelnick against lefties be out of the lineup you're gonna see kyle lewis completely replace him and even with winker like we were talking about i love jesse winker but against lefties he his stats show over the last year that he was just not a good hitter. He was below 200 against lefties. And I still think, you know, we'll we'll see him more, but it's going to be like you're talking about a rotating spot. Um, but mostly I'm you're going to see Lewis get in there against lefties. 
you're going to see him um, occasionally replace someone um, in that DH role against righties. But I think for the most part, he's, I don't know. I think he and Kelnick are probably going to see about the same amount of bats and they're going to be kind of the, the two guys of that three or that five that you see be out of the lineup more than not. I think you're going to see a lot of Julio. You're going to see a lot of Hanniger and Winker's going to be in there. Um, Kelnick, you know, if he can't hit, he can't hit lefties. And right now, I mean, if he keeps struggling, um, they're going to give Kyle Lewis a shot and, you know, Kyle's got to stay healthy. That's, that's part of the plan there as well. Um, you know, they'll mix it in. I think these guys, it's, it's a good problem to have because, you know, we want to keep these guys fresh and there, you know, there's probably going to be an injury coming down the line with someone. So it might just work itself out that way as well. Um, well, it's but, working itself out that way right now as we speak. Right. Yeah. With two and guys. Things happen, man. And, you know, if you have more guys on your team, you know, that, you know, it's just more ways to solve a problem. And I think, I think that's pretty much how it shakes out. Um, there's going to be some it's a guys, beautiful problem. There's, there's going to be good guys that are, are, are left out of the lineup, but you know what? good championship teams have good players on the bench. I mean, that's just the way it works. So if Kyle's on the bench, if Kelnick's on the bench, you have a guy that you can bring off the bench, you know, if you see a pitching change, if, you know, let's say late, it's late in the game and it's the eighth inning, Kelnick's up and there's a, a a nasty lefty on on the mound. Kyle Lewis wasn't in the lineup that day, but guess what? He can come in and it's a, it's a matchup, you know, win right there. So that's how it'll be deployed. Um and, you know, it's a good problem to have, like we we're talking about. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, the next one from uh, from our guy, Riley Maloney, he wants us, which we kind of have already done, um, but he wants us to rank DM starting five rotation. And for me, um, I got that as Logan Gilbert as my number one for the Seattle Mariners. And I think Riley was asking this for the, the length of the season, right? Like for the entire season, how would you rank them and, and what you expect them to, to do? Right. And so I think Logan Gilbert he keeps it what he's doing now, even even remotely close to it. Um, I, I look at him as number one, Robbie Ray. You know, people were saying, can Robbie Ray, is he going to regress from last year? I want to look up the stats and I wish I had done this beforehand, but how many Cy Young winners did better the next year? It's a really high bar to not regress from. And so it's very difficult for somebody not to have a worse year. Not that they're going to have a bad year, but the year's just not going to be as good as it was when they won the Cy Young. That's, I mean, that's just a damn near impossible in my opinion. So I put him as number two. Um, and then I put Flexton, Marco, and then Matt Brash. And that is, that's, that's my starting five. I mean, um, I, I think having, having Matt Brash still as the last guy, he's going to be wild. And, and I think that's his walks aren't going to help, but if he can just dial it down and, and get, you know, as many of those breaking balls as close to the zone as possible, where they're still swinging and missing and he's not leaving it in the middle of the plate, he'll be fine. I didn't, I didn't read the question that way. I thought he was talking about uh, where, where would we rank? As, as far as the MLB teams, like our whole rotation ranked, ranked among the other teams. And so I, I went and wrote it out. I have the Mets as the number one rotation giants, two brewers, three Jays, four white Sox, five Yankees, six brave, seven Mariners come in at eight. So I think we have the eighth best right now rotation and things could change. I mean, right now we're third in the AL and, uh, and ERA with, uh, 3.02 3. ERA. Yeah. So that's just as it stands right now. Now, you know, there's teams that, that probably on paper look a little bit better than us, but I, I think we kind of get it done collectively as a group. We, we do have a good number one um, in our no, one and two at least, but the last, I would say three through five flexing could, you know, put on a little makeup and look like a number three, but in, in a really good <laughs> championship team, he's probably a, a solid four. Marco is probably a solid four and Brash is a rookie that shows potential, but I mean, he's only making it through 4.1 innings, you know, and that's, that's like a number five pitcher and he's a five with potential. He's a nasty five. He shows flashes, 
but you know, he's a five nonetheless. That's the way I looked at it. If it's the way that you answered the question, I would have it almost the same. I would just put, I still think Robbie Ray is our best pitcher. And then I would go Gilbert Flexen, Marco, and then brash. Are we, uh, are we concerned about Robbie Ray's velocity? It's it's no, not at all. You're not. No, you no. think it's going to creep back up. He's in the no. low nineties right now. And what was he? I, I swear it, he was pitching was, like 96. Last yeah, year. he was. And it'll, it'll creep back up there. The first start of the year, it was the first start. And that's very, if you look at uh, across the board, velocity's down for Garrett Cole, all these different people that, that, you know, it's the first start of the year. It's, it's how it's going to go. The next start he's in the rain. Or his third start, he started to tick up, but he's he's still warming, you know, getting back to that full velocity. Once he gets into the middle of the year, he's going to be back up to, you know, sitting 94 and touching 96. Okay. I hope. I hope. I want to see that velo climb up because if you're leaning on that slider fastball combo, which is what he does, got to have a little bit more juice behind that fastball. A little bit more. 100%. You know. Yeah, I'm not, I guess, you know, not worried, still looking fine, still looking great. Um, Third question from the dugout is from Jude. And Jude, Jude wants to know where Ty France ranks in all the MLB uh, at the first base position. Jude, I don't know if you're asking about, you know, straight up stats wise, you just wanted us to go, you know, dig on baseball reference, or if you're asking for our, our opinion, if you're asking for our opinion, easy answer that's number one baby all day it looks what with what he's with what he's doing right now with what he's doing right now yes because as we touched on earlier ty france uh will repeat these stats but he's third in the al in batting average at 367 the last series we just had against kansas city he batted 500 500 he's got 17 ribbies which is second in the al he's got five ding dongs which is tied for first in the al second in the AL with 21 hits. I mean, and that's not first baseman. This is by all batters, by all batters in the AL. All these stats I just read, not just by first baseman, by every single position player batting in baseball, in the American League. With okay, those but you're, numbers, you're with answering those numbers, who's the hottest right now. He's who, the hottest. Who's, who's, has, no, who's the best in, in, in the league as of right now? So he's and better I, than Vladimir Guerrero Jr.? He's better than Freddie Freeman? Right now? Freddie Freeman's no. in the National League. I think, I, I, what was the question? He, was just, he didn't say in the American League. He said... I'm, I'm saying in the American League. He, no, didn't, he, uh, he said, okay, fine. He said in all of MLB. Well, fine. Right. Whatever. Whatever. Here, uh, by, Jude, when it's all said, no, no, Jude, when it's all said and done, Jude, Ty France this year is going to be the best first baseman in the league. Okay. When, when Vladdy Guerrero Jr. wins the MVP, that's going to look... That's going to be the stupidest thing you've ever said on the show. No, it ain't. And I'm I hate that it. you're making me say this about Ty France. Here's how Jude wanted that question answered. I know, hey, I know how he wanted that question answered. I can I can read his mind. He <laughs> want he wants to know who is, you know, where he fits in the top ten, or is he in the top ten? I have him as number seven. He's the seventh best for first baseman in the major leagues. Vladdy Guerrero, I have number one. Freddie Freeman, number two. Paul Goldsmith, number three. Matt Olson, number four. Then I got Abreu five, Alonzo six. And this is where maybe France could be six because I'm going off, you know, Alonzo's past years. And I think right now, I mean, I might with France's defense and the way he's hitting and like the potential ceiling that I see for him, I might have France six, but I put Alonzo six. So I put France seven. But he has the potential to move up. I mean, and these guys like Paul Goldsmith, who I put above him, you know, we we know what these guys are. They're not going to un- unlock too much more potential. Vladdy Guerrero, though, he's number one. Freeman is number two. And, you know, those guys are bona fide all-stars. Now, is France going to be an all-star this year? I think he will be. Ty France is going to start the American League first base all star. No, Vladimir Guaranteed. Guerrero. I don't Jr. care. I don't care. Vladdy's got the name. He's got the stats from last year. He's going he's, to. He, okay. Obviously, Vlad, I'm not taking anything away from him. He's freaking nasty. Yes. But Ty France is going to stay on the chair. He's not going anywhere as long as he stays healthy. Knock on wood. And he's going to start the American League. Uh, he's going to start the all star game at first base for the American League. But you know what? It's a, it's a strong position. Um, first base in in the uh in the major leagues so i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of star power there so being number being number six 
or number seven is great. And I think Ty France is coming into his own as an, a, a bona fide all-star and a guy that whenever he's up at the plate and you have a, a, you need something to happen. Maybe you need him to drive in a run. Maybe you need him to get on base. Maybe you need him to hit a home run. Ty France is our best hitter, maybe best player. Yeah, no, right now, right now he's our he's our best everything. I think I, mean. <laughs> I I have unbelievable confidence in Jesse Winker though. Like I have I am oh, same, bo- same, I am like zero percent bothered by what I've seen from him. He's his approach looks amazing. He's walking. He leads the league in walk, and it might be the league or the AL. I know he leads the AL in walks. He might lead the league. Oh no, he leads he leads the league, I believe, and I can yeah. triple check. And you know we we've, we've talked about how unlucky he's been. He he gets that uh, game winning walk off today. That was that was nice to see. Hopefully that kind of I don't know does something to turn his luck around. But like Winker and France are our two best players, I think. And JP's Winker. right. JP's right there. Uh, Hanniger is right there. But um, yeah, Winker Winker is going to be great. I, I'm I'm so pumped about him and Ty France. And Winker had in his last two at bats, the sacrifice fly and then the walk off. He had over eleven pitches in each at, or maybe it was eleven pitches in each at bat that he had. And so, I mean, for you to be in the box that long and making a pitcher pitch that many mm-hmm. pitches in one at bat, he saw twenty two pitches in his final two at bats. That's incredible. That's crazy. And he and he yeah. produced. He produced in both of those. The outcome went his way. So I agree. Uh, in in the, I'm not in the slightest worried about worried about him. And like I said earlier. When he starts getting hits, it ain't going to stop. It's going to be a hailstorm of Jesse Winker bombs and, and, and doubles and singles and everything. The whole freaking kitchen sink is getting thrown. I can't wait. He's got. He's, he's going to have a month. He's going to have a month like France is having. Yeah. Yeah. But see, I, I think France's month is going to go to six months and just going to carry it the whole way. He's he's Francis figured it out, man. I mean, he's well, not, he's not going to bat three seventy five on the year. What if he does? What if oh, he does? He, I mean, I'll Kevin, I'll, Garnett, I'll Kevin Garnett said it, man. I will Anything allow you to be possible. that guy. Hey, I'm going to allow you, you to be that guy on the podcast. Training, I'm going to tell you, it's just it's in spring it, training. It Zweifel, in spring training, I told you that we were going to uh, be a powerhouse. That we were going to dominate. The Mariners that this year we're gonna this year I was I prefaced it by this year and next year kind of combined that we're gonna be dominant in a powerhouse. And you're like, oh, you can't say that. You can't say that. I'm still saying it. I'm still saying it. We are going to dominate and nobody is gonna want to play us. When they see the Seattle Mariners coming to town and them coming to Seattle, they're gonna hate their life. They're gonna not they're gonna want to get out of Seattle as quick as didn't possible. I project us to win more games than you did though? I don't know, maybe. And then I had a, I project us to win the division as well. I projected that too, but my projection is take it with a grain of salt. Uh, no, I, I'm just so biased. It should never come off as like, I'm not on the same train as you with Ty France. I'm just telling you, he's not going to bat 375 like he's doing right now. So he would have to keep up this pace. But the the point stands is that I think he's, he's broken out. Uh, as we started the podcast off or the show off with is that, um, Last year, he was dealing with a little bit of a wrist injury for, uh, you know, some of those middle like most of the year. Yeah. And then he went on the IL and then he finally got it, you know, figured out. Right. And it, it kind of zapped his power. I, I always thought of him as more of a I, I thought that he would hit more home runs than he did last year. But that kind of it kind of answers the question or at least tells me why that didn't happen. And you're, you're seeing him right now. He's tied for first in the, in the AL with five home runs. I think he, he can, you know, continue this to a certain extent, maybe not quite at this pace, but yeah, I think we're seeing what Ty France could be. Yeah, no, we, uh, we are and the stats that we said earlier, all of them are a little bit higher from today's game. Um, his batting average, uh, his hits there. Are, we, I think we said he had 21 hits. He's got 24 total which is leading uh baseball or american league so that's no he's, he's leading all of baseball and hits with 24 i mean i we, we we just can't say enough good things about viva ta france i mean i mean goddamn get your baguettes and your tea and crumpets or is that britain is that britain is yes so yeah. france does Dude. france do tea does france do tea no croissants mm, croissants like oh bon voyage you know that you know where bon voyage is from 
No, oh, kind of. Sure, sure, sure. It's from uh, Z Incredibles. <laughs> oh, yeah. I never saw yes, it. You never saw The Incredibles? Nope. Stop. Stop it. Stop. 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 You're lying. I'm lying. You're lying. You're, you're lying, right? Dude, I wasn't a Disney guy. I've told you this before. Oh, Jesus, man. You, 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 uh, you blow my mind again every week of life. Well, you, you, you're crazy. You're crazy. Well, uh, what do we got next? I mean, we've kind of already touched on what's coming up with Tampa after that. We got I want, Miami. I want to ask you a question. Ask away. Shoot, shoot your shot shooter. And I have my answer for my own question, but I'm going to let you answer it. Why do you think we play so well against the Tampa Bay Rays? Uh, because we have a very similar structure to Tampa Bay, I believe, in terms of pitching, in terms of how we've accumulated our lineup. Um, I, I, I think, and we've made a decent amount of trades with them over the years. We just know them very well. And I think we've played them a decent amount over the years. And so, I don't know. I think it's just every team has that team that they end up handing it to them. And Tampa Bay is, you know, that team ha- for us. Who hands it to us besides the Astros? Um, I feel like there's an an AL Central team that just kicks our butt. Well, it's just a feel that I, oh the Yankees kill us every yeah, time the Yankees but, come to T-Mobile. Dude, they I, kill see, us. this is that's a that's a tough question right now because I honestly full hearted full heartedly believe that nobody is gonna you know pound us. Yeah, this no. year, that we are gonna be in. It's every a different single, year, different year. It's but. a different year, dude. This is just such a different team that we've never seen before, and they have brought the electric factory. To full go, to full go. Speaking of, if you haven't seen this sexy ass shirt I'm wearing, yeah, they were wearing it yesterday. Uh, the Mariners, the players, and so I had to buy that ASAP. And now it's on my shirt, it's on my body. I'm rocking it, and it's the sexiest thing. I'm never gonna take it off. I'm sleeping in it tonight. But the Electric Factory is the place to be. I have another question for you. All, All right. right, before, if you can remember, before this uh, homestand, do you remember what? the vibe was when you were talking to your friends, people that kind of care about the team and what they were asking you about the team. And like, cause I, I had like a weird, or I'll just let you go with that. What do you um, think the vibe was? Well, I have like two groups of friends, right? Like in terms of when it comes to the Mariners, when it comes to their thoughts on the Mariners and like my main group of friends who I've known since like kindergarten, they like, for the most part, like none of them like really give, they care, I guess, about the Mariners, but like they just don't really give two shits. Like they're like, oh, like they've always sucked. Like when they're right. actually good, I'll start paying attention. Like, and they they're not on the bandwagon, and they just like hear of the Mariners through me. And then I have like my other friends, you know, like my Wazoo friends. Right, we're talking every single day. On yesterday's game on Saturday, we were Facetiming the entire game. Right, and so every from. Start to finish, me and my guys were on FaceTime watching the entire game together, but we weren't together. It was over FaceTime. And they were all jazz as hell. They're fully on the bandwagon. And they're like, I am so pumped to see the Seattle Mariners. They're watching them every single day. And so they are fully bought in. Um, my Seattle friends, they're yeah, other than me and Evan, right? You know, it's 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 tough, right? Even going to even going to games with them, dude. Even going to games with them, they always leave by like the fourth or fifth inning. And like I end up being there by myself for the rest of it, which I'm like, Jesus, guys, like I, I get it, you know, like no, I don't actually I don't get it. Like, why would you spend money to on a beautiful Friday night, Saturday night to go to the baseball stadium and you leave by the fifth inning? Like, it's only what are you a three doing? hour it's only a three hour game and right. it's not like it's not a party inside the stadium like go no. to, if, are you bored go down to the friggin' beer garden man grab a we beer were in and- the beer garden that's what pissed me off we were in the beer garden and they all leave like one of my buddies like oh i left my wallet i'm like okay i have somebody like i'll buy you beer and all them. he just leaves he's like goes home and then like i'm just like i don't know so it's tough like even talking like, baseball with like my seattle friends like my main seattle friend group because they just don't I don't know. It seems like they just don't care as much. Um, the vibe, but, that, the vibe sorry. is, but the vibe has, with that being said, the vibe has increased with them. They're, we're talking about it more in our group chats. Definitely. It's not like they, like last year, like trying to talk or get one of them to go to a manners game with me is, you know, damn near impossible. Um, but at least now they're going, they're just leaving in the fifth inning, you know, whatever, I guess it's a step in the right direction. My, the vibe that I've picked up is that people are still, very skeptical and they're are very stuck in the whole like same old mariners like any time that we have like a I, I think i remember when we lost the second two to the the twins 
We were two and two then, right? Oh yeah. Like, not a huge deal. Like, yeah, we, we just dropped two in a row and it all of a sudden that those clouds roll in and people are like, Oh, I thought we were supposed to be good again, man. And then, then we go under the white Sox and lose. And it's like, Oh yeah. Like people were completely out. And then like, you, you see people looking at the stats like way too early, like the, the Winker stat and the Kelnick, which, you know, Kelnick's got to show himself, but like, I don't think people, you made a good point is that people don't know who these guys are. They don't know that Jared Kelnick was a top, you know, 20, even higher top 10 prospect top five. I think he was like at one point ranked the fifth prospect in all of the league in all and all of the land. And yeah, like I, I, I was talking to one guy about the, uh, the Cano trade and I was telling him how that was a great trade. We were able to get, you know, Cano's money off the books and, you know, look who we brought back. We brought back Justin Dunn and Kelnick and, you know, he, he was like, well, Kelnick's not very good at all. And like, we don't even have Justin Dunn. I'm like, yeah, but we moved Justin Dunn and we got Jesse Winker and Kelnick. Like, I'm, I'm just going to say it. He's going to be good. It's just the fact that he's very early in his career. And I feel like people are just looking at this team as like, wow, I thought we were supposed to be good. And it's like, dude, for one, 10 and six is good. Like that is yeah. good. And yeah. like, it's, 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 good enough for the, it's good enough for the best record in American league right now. Yeah. But they're just like, I thought we we're like, I thought we were supposed to be good. Like we're going to be in the world series this year. It's like, guys, that's not, that's not the timeline. We need to make the playoffs first. And you know what? When you make the playoffs, then anything can happen, and maybe we'll we'll end up in the World Series. Um, anything is possible. I, I, just, I just wanted I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that because I'm like I'm seeing everything that I want to see. Like yes, I'm, see, I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing everything everything that I want to see. Every, I am so so high and mighty on Jerry Depoto on everything that he's done, the curriculum and the system that he's put in place since day one, like every that's, you know, back on Christopher Negron taking over as manager. Um, he pointed out like kind of, you know, I, I like this food for thought that he pointed out. Uh, he was like, I've been in this curriculum for like four or five years. Like I've already understood exactly, you know, what this plan is, how we want to approach these types of games and in everything that we do on a day to day basis, he's been doing that just on a different level. So when he came in to take over, it was kind of just like putting on shoes that already fit, you know, it's pretty easy for him. So maybe as I was saying, it's got to be kind of difficult. And then as you were saying, you know, there's already a system in place. He's kind of just getting thrown into the mix, you know, it's just fill in the seat. Right. So it's not that difficult, but I am so high and mighty on what Jerry DePoto has been able to do on the payroll that he's been able to empty the talent that he's been able to draft and bring back in trades. I mean, dude, if I'm, somebody on san diego if i'm a diehard fan on san diego i hate us i absolutely hate the seattle yeah. manners because we have s stolen we've stolen talent from them we have stolen ty france we have stolen matt brash andres munoz luis Torrens. i'll still say taylor Chamel because we got him as well but he's not doing anything for us on the big league level but the other guys are daily contributors daily yeah man, yeah, man. shout out aj preller Let's go get him back on the phone, Jerry. Let's do more deals with the Padres. Yeah, man. Yeah. But I mean, all in all, dude, um, this is, it's, this is so much freaking fun, dude. Every single day is, it's like we were saying, you know, before the, before the season started, it's like baseball's back every single day. We get to watch the Mariners. We get to see them do something. And tomorrow I know is an off day, which is, I hate off days, but I, you know, it, it's good because the boys get their rest and, for you listeners, you got nothing to watch. So you get to listen to our beautiful voices come through your, come really into your, into your well. ears. It works. It, that does actually work out well. Maybe I prefer no games on Mondays because then you guys have to listen to us. Hmm. hmm. You got it. Yeah, for yeah. myself. <laughs> but yeah, man, just all in all, I mean, the, the chatter, the buzz around the city, the boys are buzzing. The city is buzzing. And this is, this is going to be a, a continuous ride that's nobody's going to want to get off of. This is the best ride at the amusement park and I'm paying all my tickets. And I'm paying all my coins and all my monies to continue and continuously ride this ride. Yeah. And you know what, if we, which it looks like, you know, we're going to be in this thing at the deadline. I think Jerry is going to go out and, and add to this team, whatever at the, the time it looks like we need it. If we're, if we're lacking in power, maybe we'll, we go and uh, acquire which I don't think we will be, but maybe we would go acquire a big slugger. If we need a, you know, a guy goes down in the rotation, maybe we go and, and uh, get a top half of the rotation guy. Um, we can, we have flexibility like you're talking about. 
We have payroll flexibility. We have prospects that we could move, not even in our top 10. We don't, I don't even think we'd have to dip into that top 10 prospect pool. I think that we could package up, you know, guys a little bit further down because our farm system is so healthy. I think that there's moves out there to do. And, you know, I'm seeing a team like the A's um, who are playing well right now, but you know, there's going to be a time when Frankie Montes's name comes up. There's going to be a time where you call the Reds back and you say, Hey, is Tyler Maley still available? Is Luis Castillo still available? And the Reds are probably going to be crappy. So, I mean, you know, why yeah. wouldn't they listen? Yeah, dude. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But uh, I think that about wraps it, wraps it up. So uh, with that being said, you know, we've got another week of Mariners baseball. I was supposed to, we were Monday mojo. We were going to make this trip. We we're supposed to be flying out tomorrow to uh, go to Tampa Bay and watch the M's play there and then go to Miami, watch them play there. Unfortunately, but fortunately, I guess, I don't know, more unfortunately bad timing. My sister's getting married this weekend. So uh, this time, Next week, I will have a brother-in-law for the first time ever. I can't wait for that. But um, before all that happens, more Manners baseball coming up. Tampa Bay, then Miami. We got another chance. Let's get another sweep. huh? At least one more. One more sweep, and then we'll touch uh, when we got Houston after that to continue and to round out the road trip. We got a, a lengthy road trip coming up, but then the boys come back home. Anyways, been a great week. I am thrilled where the boys are at. Appreciate y'all for listening. This is Monday Mojo. We out. Go Mariners.